Hey everyone, Pastor Caleb here with another daily devotion. Today we're going into what our tradition calls the fourth commandment, which is typically called honor your father and mother. So just one verse today, but as I've said, we're slowing down here on the 10 commandments as we go through Deuteronomy. We'll pick up the pace again once we're done with the 10 commandments, but we really want to focus our hearts on each of these because uh, they're part of what at least Martin Luther and I would agree with him thinks are the top six most important, really all encompassing teachings of the Bible. That if you get these six things, then you can understand the doctrine of what Christianity is all about. Um, so the Ten Commandments are part of that, and we need to slow down and figure out what those things are. So the fourth commandment today, if you want to follow along, of course, it's posted in the text of the description of the video uh, or the podcast, uh, but you can open another browser if you'd like. Deuteronomy 5.16 says, Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live long and that it will go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving. This is God's word. Um, so first, let's just pull out a couple things right from the text, and then we'll kind of extrapolate this into how it, uh, it's, it applies to us as New Testament Christians. But it says here that you may live long and that it will go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving. Uh, it's interesting because this is uh, later in the New Testament called the first command that comes with a promise. In other words, that if you do this thing, then therefore this will be the most likely outcome of your actions, right? Uh, the first three commandments don't have any promises, right? No other gods, don't use God's name in vain, no graven images, remember the Sabbath day. It never says do those things so that like good things will happen to you. And that's because primarily, you know, the relationship between God and man, which is encapsulated in the first three commandments is a relationship of God doing stuff for us regardless of who we are. And we're simply acknowledging that, right? Um, if God is the only God, then there's nothing that he has to do in order to prove himself to be the only God. It's just a matter of whether we acknowledge whether he's the only God or not. If his name is the name that is above all names, then he doesn't have to make his name any more valuable or any more true. We simply have to acknowledge that and treat it as such. If the Sabbath day is set aside for worshiping God and resting and letting him do his work, uh, we don't have to, we can really literally do nothing in order to do that command correctly, right? Um, so this is all about God to us in the first three commandments, but now we switch and we really get the second table of the law, that's what many people call it, where the relationship that is talked about in the last seven commandments, depending on how you number them, is the relationship not between me and God, but between me and my neighbor, the people who are around me. And in many ways, this uh, command that it will go well with you and you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for the Old Testament Christians, and then in more of a general way for us, that life will just generally be better for us if we follow this command, can actually be applied throughout all the commandments that come after this. Um, you could generally say that if you're not going to murder people, that's going to go better for you in life. If you don't cheat on your spouse or sleep with somebody who is not your spouse, it's generally going to go well for you in life. If you're not taking other people's stuff, it's generally going to go well for you in life. And so you can apply this idea of it is going to go well with you to these last seven commandments because they are how God says, now live out my grace in the world in this way that is in line with the way that God has made the world to work. So one thing we need to remember is kind of the overarching theme of the Ten Commandments is God saying, look, I made this world to be perfect and you were perfect, humanity, but you messed that up in falling into sin. And so now you need the blueprints. You don't just operate perfectly just because you're in the perfect existence. Now you are operating contrary to it and you need the blueprints of what it's supposed to look like in order to live in line with the way the system works. Um, maybe a way you could think about this is you can drive your car uh, with a with your feet on the steering wheel and your hands on the pedals and like a, um, a periscope from your head that's now underneath the dashboard of the car out into looking out the front windshield. Uh, I suppose you can drive a car that way, but it's a really foolish way to drive a car because a car is not designed to work that way. Uh, in the same way, there is a way you can live in this world. And sure, you can like exist in the world and live that way, contrary to the way that God has designed things to work. But you're putting yourself in a whole lot of danger and everyone around you in a whole lot of danger. So God says, follow these commands because they are the blueprint for how life is supposed to work. And one more thing that I want to add before we go into specifically this commandment, because it's really showing up throughout all the commandments, but kind of gets a little bit more obvious to us here in the last seven commandments, that the God's blueprints are not just you don't do this, but that you in turn then therefore do this thing. 
Uh, a lot of times people think of the commandments and they, they kind of think that they're all slaps on the hand, like don't, no, stop, <laughs> desist. <laughs> and it's true, that is how they are worded. But Martin Luther did a really cool thing when he wrote in his small catechism, his explanation to the Ten Commandments, where he said, yeah, yeah, it's definitely saying like, don't do these things, but there is an implied, therefore do this instead. Um, so like with all the commandments, you know, for example, um, like uh, the the uh, second commandment, you should not use the Lord's name in vain. Uh, he says we should fear and love God that we do not use his name to curse, swear, lie, or deceive, or use it superstitiously, but instead call upon his name in every trouble, prayer, pr pray, praise, and give thanks. And so he says, you know, there's a, a don't do aspect to this, but there's definitely a do aspect to this. So obviously this command, honor your father and mother, is one of those that is worded in a do sort of way and it gives us that flavor, although the rest of them are you shall not, right after this, we should always be thinking more in the positive. What are we what are we striving for? Not just what are we keeping ourselves from, but let's let's think about how we can live a positively forward moving, God pleasing life. Okay, so with that as kind of the overarching themes of the second table of the law, let's talk about this honor your father and mother business. Um, it's obviously very clear that we should honor our father and mother. That is the scripture's expectation. And of course, people get into all sorts of, you know, excuses with this because there are a lot of fathers and mothers who are not good fathers and mothers. And are we supposed to listen to them even if they're not fathers and mothers? Or sorry, good fathers and mothers. Um, you know, the I think you have to understand the word honor in uh, a little bit broader of a way than just obey. Um, there definitely are places in the Bible, Ephesians 6 is one of them, where it talks about children obey your parents in the Lord. But the general command here is to treat your parents with respect appropriate to your relationship at that time. So that let me break that down for you. Like uh, my relationship with my parents when I was three is different than my relationship with my parents now that I'm 30. That doesn't mean that neither of that they both both relationships can't have honor in them. They're just going to look different as I honor them. And this is a huge thing because, you know, a lot of times we think that our relationship with our parents as them being parents and we being children is kind of that way until we leave the house. But really, God would say this is a lifelong thing that you would honor your father and mother, that you would continue regardless of whether you're six or they're 60, uh, that you would honor them, give them the honor that is due to a person who's put in authority over you. Then we have to broaden this idea because the New Testament broadens it as well and talks about it not just in the relationship of parent to child, but then really of any authority figure over anyone who is under authority. Um, so the way that the Lutherans have talked about this, and I think it's really helpful, is talking about the three estates. So they talk about the estate of the family, the estate of the church, and the estate of the state. In other words, there are three kind of built-in institutions into any society that, uh, that God has sort of just naturally put us into. And while there are other like variations of this society, or sorry, those states, estates, uh, those three are just constant. And what the Christian ought to do is think of themselves in each of those estates and say to themselves, who am I under the authority of in this estate? And who am I in authority over in this estate? And how can I use those relationships in the way that God has prescribed that I am to use them? So, for example, in the family, you know, I, at this point, am a father, so I have authority over my children. Yet, at the same time, my parents are still alive, so I still am under their authority. I have honor for them, and even though that relationship isn't that they're going to dictate when I'm going to go to bed at night or anything like that, I still have that honor for them. Then in the church, um, God has placed the pastor in the position of authority over his church. He's also then put the men of the congregation in authority over their families in the church and the other families of the church as leaders in that congregation. So, if you are one of those, then you would see yourself as using that authority for the sake of those under the authority in the same way that God uses his authority over us for our benefit. And if you're under that authority, if you're a woman in the congregation or a child in the congregation, you look to your pastor and you look to the men of your congregation to be the leaders, to be the authority figures, and then also in the state. And that's going to look different depending on your form of government, but um, which I think actually deserves some discussion, really. I think, I think we ought to not just assume we know exactly who's in charge um, when we talk about our governmental structures, but you can apply this principle to the state and then say, okay, who are my governing authorities and who do I deserve to give or who who deserves my honor because they are in authority, not necessarily because they are a good ruler, but because they are in the position of authority that God has given them. 
So these three estates are really helpful for understanding our roles in society, and they build on each other, right? Um, good families mean good churches, which mean good states. Generally, you can look at a government, and if the government is falling apart, there's a pretty good chance that the church fell apart before that, and the church fell apart because the family structure fell down before that. I bet you could track that in just about every society that has fallen down. Um, that is generally the way that it works because that's the way God has designed it. So we are called to respect those in authority. And obviously that's difficult sometimes. But what God says is don't do this because it works out for you. Don't do this because you receive some benefit. Do this because I am going to make things work out generally for your good because of this. And obviously there are some situations where honoring your authority figures is not going to work out well for you. But remember that the ultimate authority figure over those authority figures still has your best interest in mind. It is making all things work for your good. I think it's also worth saying, I know I'm going a little bit over time, that we do need to be conscious of things like abuse of authority, whether that's, you know, in the case of actually just using your power to abuse people, or whether it's physical or sexual or emotional or spiritual or any of these types of abuse. Obviously, that is not a situation where you need to honor a person who has thrown away their authority in such a way. Um, and that means that you would try to get out of that situation if you can at all help it. And if that's you, if you're in a situation where you are being abused, um, first of all, reach out to us for help. We would be glad to help you uh, figure Figure out how to navigate that difficult situation. Um, but also, I think we need to hear um, God's words to the abuser that says, God has given you this authority for a very good reason, and he has asked the people under your authority to honor you in your position. So take that position as a role that God has given you for their benefit, not so that you can take advantage of them. Hopefully that's helpful. Thanks for sticking with me for this longer commandment. We'll see you next time for the fifth commandment. If you like what you're seeing here, make sure you share it with folks. And if you're watching on YouTube, click on the links that are on the screen so you can see some other things that we're doing. God bless.